just a quick remark. So uh, I was being asked for an example of where you can see this modularity of uh, torch power. So one that I like, I'm going to cover this in class, but if you're eager to get to see how this is done, have a look at the GitHub code of Virtual Zaremba. You can just Google LSTM Zaremba, um, and that's the code for his paper, Learning to Execute. And there's two modules in his code. Um, there's an LSTM function, and then there's a network. Um, and this stuff that Alex Graves has been using for a long time. Um, and if you put these very simple modules together, um, like some researchers at Google have done, you can build by using simple modules. You know, each module here is itself a, an interesting type of network. It's on the side here. But we can combine them um, in sort of temporal structures that have memory in them. And we're able to actually, if you provide sentences in one language and sentences in another language, uh, it learns to translate. So you can, you have a model that learns to go from one language to another language. And you should think of translation as a very general way of going from one kind of data in the sequence to a different kind of data in the sequence. So you could go from English to um, a sequence that basically tells you the structure of that sentence. It tells you what's a noun, what's a verb, um, and so on. And you could have music to language, or you could have gazes in an image, and then uh, a description of what it is that you're seeing as you're gazing at the image. Um, and all of these things have been done. Um, 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 there's so much, I mean, you could have speech commands and you could have a sequence of actions of a robot if you want to control a robot. If, you, if you're playing computer games and you want a sidekick character that, you know, you're sort of shooting monsters or whatever you're doing in the game and you can ask your sidekick to, you know, run around the monsters or whatever it is you to do. Um, so, um, the approach leads to being able to build such models that are, uh, that are extremely flexible and extremely uh, powerful. And that um, actually make us question uh, some of our beliefs about what can be learned and what can't be learned by machines. Like for example, um, what I mentioned, going from a sentence to syntax, that's showing that you could learn syntax. Um, um, it's it, it in itself quite interesting. For, for, for many years, people thought that syntax is something you couldn't learn. All right, uh, but in this lecture, the focus will be on components. Um, these models are probably the most popular, uh, besides these new things, LSTMs, um, are the most popular models in, in the world of deep learning. And because if, if you want to solve problems, and this is the reason actually why companies are so interested in this, because covenants allow you to do object recognition. Given an, any image on the web, you can figure out exactly who is in that image, what are they wearing, um, and what pose are they, etc., etc. So don't try to protect your information by encoding it as an image, because any text in an image can be read. Uh, no matter how you write it, uh, no matter what language it is, um, and uh, but it you know it's not just about like snooping on you, but it's also about being able to un uh, and advertising and all that. But it's also being able to develop all sorts of apps. Um, you can go around and imagine. As soon as we figure out how to build low uh, energy cons consumption devices, you would walk around in a foreign country. You arrive in Japan. You look at all these strange signs, like more or less like these. Uh, but everything will look to you in English as you look around, and it, you know everything. Or you could even be, have it being translated to voice, and you would hear uh, what's around you, even if you're blind. If we get the technology right. Um, Certainly for partially impaired uh, blind people, I think this promises a lot. Um, especially if you go to voice, then even if you're blind, you will get a signal as to what you're seeing. And that's, you know, the past 99 is arriving. It's extremely useful. Um, okay, so in, 
and of course this image is not the only input, the only signals. There's haptics, um, um, sort of very important for robotics and so on. And um, there's also um, speech recognition, extremely important because when people actually um, ask for something on the phone, it, they usually really need it. And so from a marketing perspective, you can see how this is how useful, or advertising perspective, business perspective, this is extremely useful. Um, okay, I'm going to focus on images and I'll come to language at the end of the class. Uh, so, in images, a component pretty much looks like this um, you have your input data, oops, which is an image here. Important, this is a grayscale image. Images are RGB, so images are really volumes with three channels. Okay, start thinking in terms not of images as matrices, but think of images as tensors. In other words, three matrices. So there's a depth as well. Um, and every convolution architecture sort of has these two uh, operations. Uh, one operation is convolution, where a filter, like, uh, uh, and uh, we're going to go over this in detail, but essentially you take a small window, a filter with something that has a particular shape, and you move this filter over the whole image. Think of this as search. You're, you're looking for where in the image. Um, if the filter is a, uh, a, a sort of a vertical line, you're looking in the image for vertical lines. If the filter is the image of a dog, you're looking in the image for images of dogs. And the filters could have different sizes, and we'll see that when we nest, if we nest appropriately, then the filters will have, um, will be able to see a big part of the image once they get to very high layers. So. When you do this, each unit, each neuron, and the number of neurons in this case will be the size of this image. Um, sorry, the, that's actually not true. The number of neurons will be the depth, because we're about to do one extra trick. But we will assume that the same, and this is very key, we will assume that the same neuron is being used for each of these images that we call feature maps. Okay? So one neuron goes over the image and I'll just, you sort of when when the when it moves if it moves up here then it would project to this point. So by move by sliding over the whole image you will be able to construct um, this entire image. And then you pick another neuron, which might be a horizontal bar, and you do, do the same thing. And so you'll have as many neurons as you have maps here. Now, what's useful about this is that um, the parameters are being shared. So for each map, I'm using the same parameters theta. I'm just, which is in this case a vertical bar at parameters. Uh, I'm just sliding it over. If I use the full neural network, I would have, I would need as many parameters as the depth, height, and width of this volume. And that would be just far too many. We wouldn't be able to fit them, again, in our machines. So convolutional networks um, allow us to, convolution gives us this, it gives us a much more, much smaller representation, because the parameters are shared. The other thing that we get is that if an object appears at different parts in the image, um, we will see some firing response here. So they also give us, they give us invariance to location. Um, once we have done the convolutions, most architectures then tend to do something called uh, subsampling or mac or pooling. Okay, so we usually have convolutions. Convolutions can be followed by like a ReLU unit. In practice, that's the typical implementation. You have a convolution, you have a ReLU to get some nonlinearity, and then you feed it through uh, a pooling layer. <laughs> and what a pooling layer does 
is it looks at the region. Uh, if it's a max pooling layer, it just looks at what's the maximum value here, and it only keeps the maximum value that occurs. So it dumps samples. It only picks one single value. And you do this because, because of two reasons. One, storage. This guy here is much smaller than the guy on the left. Um, and the other reason is invariance. If in this little patch something moves slightly, if there's a slight change in illumination, I will still pick that point. So you become insensitive to perturbations. So pulling just gives you um, some sort of local invariance. And typically what people do these days is they use as many of these layers as they can train. 30 layers or so. 30, 60. Uh, at the last competition, I think it was 19 layers that Karen used uh, to win um, ImageNet. And then at the end, often people slap in a fully connected neural network, which uh, uh, some researchers are questioning whether it's valuable or not. An interesting thing is most of the computation is here. So this is very computationally intensive. And this is very storage. Uh, actually, this is very parameter intensive. Most, like 90 something percent of the parameters are in that uh, fully connected output layer, which is just like a standard neural network with full connections. Um, but the, the pulling operations, moving, and so on, are the things that are taking a lot of our storage. And we rely on GPUs to be able to do them efficiently. Uh, parameters are a problem because if you have too many parameters, you can't store all the parameters in one machine. You have to break the parameters across several machines. And communication is what's killing us. Uh, communication costs a lot. Uh, whenever you go, you have to transmit something between cores. Um, never mind going to disk or going to a bus, uh, uh, an external bus. You, you will get in trouble with communication costs. Um, another problem is storage. Um, we, co we compute these feature maps, we have to store them. And so storage is uh, one of the big challenges with these models. And in the end, uh, um, after, after you do all this, you're able to predict what objects are in the image and also the location at which they are if, um, if you have that as your training data. Um, here's the model that won ImageNet two years ago of Matt Zeiler and Rob Fergus. Um, again, the same idea, so, so just illustrating it one more time. You do these feature maps, convolve, and, this, and pull at the same time, and then you do this densely connected net at the end. And when you do this, the parameters that you get, because the input is an image patch, and each image pixel here gets multiplied by one theta. So there is a matrix theta. That matrix theta um, um, is a matrix of parameters. And so a matrix can be visualized on the computer screen. Uh, it's an image as well. So the parameters are images. Um, and this here is one image. This is one matrix of parameters. This is another matrix of parameters. So each of these um, uh, parameters seen as images here is what the net learned. So basically, it, in the first layer, it learned to look for lines. It makes sense. If, I, if you look at shapes, you, you want to draw it's like what you draw, do naturally when you're drawing. You draw the contours. Um, in, the, in the next layer, um, then it starts getting some textures and so on. And as you progress, it starts getting these cool objects like dogs and etc. There's some other interesting people and so on. Um, okay, let's go to the basics though. What is convolution? Um, and I'm going to go over 1D convolution. How many of you have seen convolution before? Not many. Okay, so this is uh, it's a good thing I prepared this. So we're going to use very simple images, 1D images with only three pixels, so that we can write it down. 
I'm going to have an image X and it has pixels X1, X2 and X3. I'm also going to have a filter. Okay, Filter is essentially what I'm calling the matrix of uh, parameters. So the, the, the guy that I slide over the image. And so this filter W is going to have two entries, W1 and W2. And I'm going to compute an output that's going to have three, uh, no let's do two for simplicity, Z1 and Z2. So the way I do the sliding is I first do W1 times X1 and W2 times uh, X2 and then I will do W1 times X2 and W2 times X3. So basically um, Z1 is going to be W1 times X1 plus W2 times X2 and Z2 is going to be equal to W1 times X2 plus W2 times X3. Okay, so you can see that I basically slid. I essentially consider two cases. I consider the case where W is on top right here and then I move W and W is on top here. So that's the sliding. For an image it's the same thing, which is, except that you're sliding a whole block. And you could also slide a 3D object, or a 4D object, or any dimensional object. Same idea. Um, now, the way I'm going to write, I'm going to try to generalize these equations, and I'm going to write that zi prime is equal to the sum over i of wi times um, what was it? okay times x i prime plus i minus one and this goes from one and I'm gonna give the size of this filter I'm gonna call it uh, which is uh, mf just think of mf as the size of the filter so this goes from one to two. And that, uh, that equation summarizes these two equations. So you can check that when, um, if I, so if I start at 1, I need to subtract a 1, because if I prime is 1 and I is 1, then I have 1 plus 1 minus 1 x1, and I would have w1 x1, which is this term here, and this guy is still 1, this guy moves to 2, so I get w2 and then x uh, 1 plus 2 minus 1 which is x2 and then you can check that with the other one you have the same thing. Um, there's another operation you can do with this w that we're going to define is and we're going to call um, so this is called correlation. Okay. I'm just um, if something is similar if, if the w and the x are similar so you'll um, you'll get some value if the W and the X are not similar um, and if they're actually the opposite. If one is one zero and the other one is zero one, you will get a zero. Uh, so, so in a sense it's a measure of how similar they are. So think of this as similarity. You have filters and you're looking in the image for things that are similar to your filter. The catch is you don't know the filters. So learning is about figuring out what are good filters. So what are the things that if you were to look for them in the image, you would see them a lot. And learning is about that. It's finding these, um, all the properties that occur in the world, the natural data, that happen enough times that, that they're more than just noise, that, 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 you, can't, that you can't rule out. The common things in the world. Um, or the, st the statistics of the data, in, in other words. So we could write it like this. Another way that we can write it is by introducing 
w um, and I'm gonna call this the flip operator and what flip does is as the word implies is just w2 w1 it flips the order of the fold so it just flips it the other way around and if you do that we can write uh, zi prime as again the sum over i wi but you can write it as and I'm not going to go um, yeah why not I'll, I'll do it mf okay. you can write it in this way and it, it turns out that the two are equivalent um, you can convince yourself because what we did is we flipped this we flipped the filter but we also flipped uh, um, whoops sorry I made a mistake here I'm still keeping X the same way as it was and I need it I need to keep it exactly the same way because I only goes from 1 to 2 but X goes from 1 to 3 so I have to keep its indices but this is going to be the index of W flipped so if I rewrite the equation this way I get the same um, as um, I get these two guys are equal um, when written like this, when you have it, basically when you have i and plus, when you have minus, so you would have i and then minus i here, this thing is what we call convolution. Now, convolution is a huge field. Uh, if you do an undergrad in, in, in engineering, in electric engineering or physics, you will devote an entire course to convolution. There's beautiful theory between convolution and Laplace transforms and Fourier transforms. So I'm in no way making a justice here, but, but I'm just telling you the very basic, very, in very basic terms for a discrete signal, what convolution is. And, and that's enough to sort of, uh, for you to understand what convolution means in the context of, conv of uh, convolutional networks. But in particular, the thing to, to note here is that correlation is the same as convolution with a flipped filter. Okay, that, uh, that turns out to be a useful thing to know because you'll see it mentioned quite often. Quite often when you read papers they will use be flipping filters here and there and sometimes they use the word convol uh, convolution, sometimes they use the word correlation and unless you know this you, you would be confused as to what's going on. <coughs> okay, so that basically is convolution. Um, there's one more thing that's important to note um, if we define the size of this guy as M2 and this is as M1 which in this case is 3, in this case is 2 um, then M2 will always be smaller than M3 by 1 in this case and in fact when I move this window I'm only moving this window in steps of 1, 1 by 1 if I moved in steps of different uh, steps um, I would have to um, an even smaller window here and for this case you um, what's the formula m2 is equal to I'll, I'll let you derive this at home but one thing we typically do so there is this thing called stride which you have to choose when you build a convolutional layer is by how much you jump typically people just jump by one um, the other thing is you have to, dis um, there is a sort of glitch in the sense that you convolve with the filter and this guy is a bit smaller. And so to deal with this boundary effect, um, if you have this, what folks typically do is they augment the boundary with two zeros. And now the filter can actually be placed here or here or here or here. That is so that you that is so that the next layer has exactly the same size as the previous layer. So this is called zero padding and you'll hear about it as well in a lot of papers. So these are standard tricks that folks do with convolution. 
Um, so zero padding is a trick. You have to decide by how much you stride. And when you do computer vision and you have many filters, you also have to choose how many filters you have. Um, it is an art to tune these models. Um, I recommend you read, um, um, there's a Stanford blog by this guy, Andre Karpathy, and I think there's a course as well associated that he, where he was a TA or something. Um, and uh, he sort of goes over s several heuristics as to how you should tune each of these various parameters when you're building a ConfNet. And um, I, I do recommend it. It's very, it's very nice. It's a very nice complimentary presentation to this lecture. Okay, so those are the sort of things that you need to keep in mind when you do convolution. And that's basically what, the, that's it. That's what convolution is. You, you, you have a signal, you're multiplying by a, f uh, a matrix of parameters. And then you just should think of this this way as you're sliding. Um, you have an image and you're sliding a filter all over the image. And every time you slide, you compute an output for each position. You compute an output. And that's always the same filter. I do this, and if I compute the output, I get one thing. And if I want to do something else, I have to use another filter. And then I get another output image. And I get as many output images or feature maps, as we've been calling them, as I would have, um, as I would have uh, uh, filters. Um, so here's a picture that sort of illustrates this with images. Um, if my filter is this guy here, and my image is this X, now we're moving to 2D. And, and basically, think of uh, dark shaded, uh, as, say, pixel value 1, and light shaded pixel value 0. I'm sliding this filter, and in this case, I've done some zero padding on the edge. Well, I haven't. This guy did it. Um, and so here, there is no... In uh, when you multiply the filter times the image, you get a zero because there's no dark uh, value set to one. And, and you get the idea. W when I get to a place where there's dark points, then these three fire, so I get a three. Here I get a two. And so altogether, by moving this filter over the image, I get this as the output image. So in this case, the filter sort of blurs the image. And that's essentially the, so this is the feature map for that filter. Um, typically, um, we, uh, when you use, when we learn filters, we end up with filters that look like this in the first layer. And so they're looking for edges. And, as a, and, and the output images of the filters will look like these images. So this image is the result of taking the guys that appear, the images, the filters that appear below, convolving them with the image, and then you start getting features that sort of capture shape. And then you do the standard pipeline, you do the down sampling, you can apply nonlinearities, nonlinear layers, and you can sort of do contrast enhancement and so on. Um, one way to think of these in vision is to start thinking of them as volumes because in effect when we convolve the input image has three channels and, and this is the model that won the first neural net to win ImageNet three years ago Alex Krzyzewski's uh, neural network and this is exactly the, the model that he had where he's doing this convolution and here he explains he had strides of four then he did this pulling uh, operation. He does convolution again with these volumes. These are the filters over which he goes. Um, as you go to the next layer, now you don't have just three channels, but you have as many channels as you as filters that you used in the first layer, um, and so on. Um, in, in what I will use in my, and this will come up later, um, when we analyze just convolution, I'm going to use um, I'm going to consider the convolution of a single for a single step where we have a volume here
and this volume will fire just a single unit up here when we look at it. So I'm going to use the following indices to explain this operation in detail. Um, there will be indices I, uh, J, I for the depth, J for the width, and then F uh, for filters or channels. And then as we move up, I'm going to use a prime to indicate that we're uh, in the next layer. Okay. And essentially, um, so, uh, and then my filter, uh, I'm going to say that the filter has some width WF, it has some height, so this is the width of the filter, height, Ah, and F is the number of filters. Okay. Um, now essentially what we need to do, if you do torch, is implement a layer that does this operation. A layer that slides this window and multiplies, um, multiplies all the numbers in this box times the number in the X. And that's what it looks like. Um, oh, here for here I was using W, but in the course we also use parameters theta. So statisticians tend to use theta. Neural net people tend to use W for because it means weights of the neural network. Um, but essentially, you have these parameters. Now, importantly, uh, the parameters go from a little patch that exists in some channel to some other channel. So there is this parameter exists as a particular height here, that's F prime. And when I'm convolving, I if I want this is a block of parameters, if I only want one particular slice, if I want to index a parameter here inside this box, I need indices I, J, and F. So in total, for all these parameters, I need i, j, f, and f prime. So I end up with all these indices. And in fact, typically we actually don't pass just one data at a time through the ConfNet to be more efficient in a CPU. Um, and this is something that is done in the practical that we handed to you. So uh, Misha and Brandon did a lot of work to make sure that that would be the case. Um, but like the demo that's available online, actually only passes the points one at a time when you do many batches. And if, if, you, if you do, you're trying to use the GPU efficiently, you should pass the whole mini batch through. So typically there's yet, not on theta, but on X, there's yet another index, which is the index of the mini batch, which I have omitted in, in this presentation. I think there's already way too many indices in this. But basically, you have a volume. So for a volume, you need three indices. And you have an output which has three com coordinates. Uh, I, J, F prime. Um, you have an input that has three coordinates. And this is exactly the formula that we had before. I've just taken it. It's no different than this friendly guy that we had here. The only thing that's changed is that instead of just having one index, we now have to keep track of volumes. And so there's many indices. But in effect, what we're doing is this multiplication of theta times x and we're just looping over the whole, going from the s one to the height of the filter, the size of the filter, and we're repeating this for all the filters. Um, in the course, I often um, you add a column of ones to the parameter. Um, here, to get the bias term that allows me to move the line up and down, here I've explicitly put it separately. Um, then the other thing you need to do, the, the rest is, and this actually was my whole train ride this morning, and Brennan had to help me with, um, <laughs> it took forever. Um, these are very tedious derivatives just because of the, they're really easy, but you have to keep track of not making mistakes with the indices. Um, if you want a derivative with uh, the parameter for layer F prime, um, you have to take the derivative of this function, uh, which is uh, the function that appears on top, this is f, 
um, and so you end up with just the input. So in this case it's really easy and that's how you would get the, the derivative with respect to any parameter. Um, you also need the derivative with respect to the input, the delta. So we always need three things. Um, and there, I'm sort of going to let you do this at, or go over this carefully at home. Um, I introduced double indices here. So it's the same expression as before, I just added two primes, uh, whereas before there were no primes. And that's so that when I do derivatives, I do the derivative, derivative with respect to the input ijf, so that I don't ha end up with yet another set of derivative, uh, another set of symbols here. And when I do this derivative with ijf, all the terms will be zero except for the term ijf. And let's look at just i. Um, so everything will be zero unless i um, unless i is equal to i prime uh, plus i essentially this guy. It's only when I when this guy happens to be equal to when I differentiate this with respect to this, only when this guy happens to be equal to i, I will keep that term and I will get the corresponding term. So the reason why I write this this way is because then I can solve for i double prime, which is this guy, so I know which is the term of theta that I need to keep, because I only keep one. And if you solve for i double prime, you get this guy here, and that's what I've plugged in here. And then you do the same thing for j. Um, there's only one channel over f prime and only one input f, so I keep those the same way. And that essentially now is our backward message. Um, the other operation that we do is the downsampling, the pulling. Again, what I do is I use, I want to compute the output. So in pulling, I have a region like say 4, and then I'm going to get as the output a much smaller image where the 4 gets replaced by a 1. Okay, so I select the max. So for example, if, if there's a 1, 3, 5, 6 here, this guy will be 6. And I keep track of the position. So I keep track of that it was the bottom left, whatever coordinate, 2, 2 for this corresponding. So I know the gates. Um, so I get a 6 there. If I pick the max, um, and then this is the window over which I'm looking. So that's the W. And I could have, sorry, omega. I could define this window in different ways. And if I take the derivative, um, then essentially, um, so I still have my deltas as before, and so I need to take the derivative of this guy with respect to the input, um, and then this will be on only when ij is, um, if I want to propagate a message back ij, only when ij corresponds to the, the pair i prime j prime that was selected. So if in the forward pass you selected this, your delta message gets copied to that unit, and the delta message for all the other units is zero. Okay, because essentially there was no change of information here. You didn't multiply it by anything. All you did is you gated, and so all you've done is you've created a door, and so the information goes through the the, the new rewiring. I find that somewhat unsettling because when you go back, you drop a lot of information. But in a sense, when you go forward, you're compressing. Um, getting more invariance means that you will lose information. Um, at least in, in, in this particular form. Um, and so coming back, uh, you're missing that information so you can't reconstruct the signal. This is problematic because it, um, it allows us to see an image and be able to tell whether it's a dog or a pen or s something else but it doesn't allow us to imagine the dog. This is not a very good model for imagining the world um, um, implemented in this way. So there's still a lot of work in trying to figure out how to do this better. 
And Jeff Hinton's been pushing an approach called capsules, which is very exciting. I recommend you look at it. Um, I'll write it down here. Um, and there's also a very nice paper that came out of DeepMind very recently. It's an archive. It's called Drop. I strongly recommend it. It actually does generate super nice images. It sort of generates like digits. It generates like numbers, like any numbers you would appear in with different fonts and colors and so on. Uh, it's super cool. All right. So the nice thing about Torch, and once you've implemented these layers, is that it's really trivial for you to go and implement a ConvNet. And you can implement this in your next practical. So you basically create a sequential module. You might reshape the data so that it's in the right size. And then essentially you do convolution, nonlinearity, pooling. Convolution, nonlinearity, pooling. And you repeat this many times. And then there are some smart students that spend their lives adjusting these numbers until it works. Um, other folks out there are trying to come up with automatic ways of setting those um, um, hyperparameters. Um, initialization is very important. This is something we've learned over the last few years. And I forgot to mention that. Um, there's some very nice work by this guy, Xavier uh, Glojo, uh, where instead of initializing all the weights to be just the same amount of uh, random, um, you look at the variances essentially look at what happens with the random signal. If you had a random input and you propagate it through the network, the variance is sort of scaled through the network. And it's important that you keep track of those scales and unscale them so that there's no explosion of... You might be initializing something small here, but because it gets amplified, it ends up being big somewhere. And so um, even some of the recent work that uh, the folks that beat uh, I think their claim was that they beat human performance for the first time. They were using um, that trick. Um, they were coming, up, you know, using variations of that. That's sort of a very hot area. How to come up with smart initialization? Um, all right. So I'm just going to end this in the last two minutes of the lecture. So so far I've talked about images um, and how you essentially implement the pooling, the convolutional layer for images, and in Torch, you essentially just plug many of these. And, and at the end, you slap in one big linear layer and a soft mic. So that's your fully connected network. Uh, these models are also used a lot for language. Um, if you're interested in particular on, on this view of differentiation with blocks, then I actually recommend um, you look at the work of Roland Colobert and Jason Weston. In particular, they have a, uh, a paper titled, uh, I think if you Google NLP almost from scratch, you'll, you'll find it. They do all sorts of very cool applications to natural language processing of components. And in the appendix, they essentially have a lot of forward messages derivatives. So they actually do use this modular approach. Um, there's also a paper on this that uh, the modular approach, the first paper that I saw on this is by a researcher who writes amazing papers. I strongly recommend you essentially read everything he writes. Leon Botto, he has a very nice paper on um, the modular approach to back propagation. That is essentially the only paper I know that sort of seriously devotes time to talk about. Um, um, you know, the advantage of coding nets this way. There's been other works, and of course, a lot of people are aware of it because that's how we implement tools in practice. So soon I think the presentations in books will be doing that. Um, convolutional nets for language are old things. As you can see, they appeared, um, oh, I don't know when this paper was from. This is a very old paper with Jeff Hinton. Um, I'm embarrassed that I didn't put the year, but it's very, very old, as you can tell by the, the writing and the fonts. And in those days, note how small the networks were. Three units, eight units, whereas before I was talking about a million units, a um, hundred thousand and so on. Um, so for language, what people do is each word, 
gets coded as what folks call a one one hot encoding. So there's a vector for all the words in your vocabulary, and you put a one um, if the word appears uh, there. And then this huge vector gets multiplied by a matrix that is the size of the number of words in your vocabulary by the number of features. Um, so when you multiply this matrix, you essentially just pick a row of the ma of the matrix. That's called a word embedding. Um, and so that's what um, you then form a matrix that if you have several words in a sentence, so word one up to word S in a sentence, that gives you now that matrix is how your word is being mapped to a continuous space. Um, the trick here is that words are discrete things, but what they refer to, meaning, is not discrete. And so, in a sense, what we, uh, uh, this discreteness is somewhat artificial, I believe. And what these nets are trying to do is try to map these discrete objects, these categorical objects, to continuous spaces again. And in continuous spaces, it becomes a lot easier, thanks to continuity, to do all sorts of transformations on these and optimizations. Um, so, um, we're able to do things like translation and so on, because it's easier to operate in continuous spaces than in discrete spaces. Um, and so here, um, um, uh, Nal uh, was illustrating convolution where he's moving a filter on the sentence from left to right, and then he's taking out the outputs. Um, and this is when he does zero paddings. Um, and his implemented models, Nal was a, is still a PhD student here, in fact, um, so what he does is the same idea as what we do for images. Um, you have uh, f matrices that are features by words, um, which you have to learn, and then you convolve them with some filters. And he has this really cute trick that instead of just picking the max of a subset of units, he takes, say, the max five, so what he calls dynamic k-max pulling, because he also adjusts how many he chooses. It could be five, could be three, depending on the size of the input. That way he keeps the structure of the same size. So he readjusts it. And essentially what he does is convolution, pulling operations, and then does some appending at the end. And he's able to take sentences, and then he predicts things like sentiment about sentences, or whether the sentence is positive or negative. So you can classify tweets into all sorts of categories. Take, um, one common thing that people, folks do is take a lot of tweets with happy faces, you know, the emoticons, and a lot of tweets with sad faces, and you learn a classifier. And if you take all the tweets that mention the word Obama with happy and sad faces, you can build a predictor of how happy people are with Obama, or with any brand. And this is actually quite effective. It's very uh, stupidly trivial, but it's effective because you have a lot of data. Uh, Misha Daniel, um, who, by the way, helped me a lot with um, getting this the last lecture set up uh, with the view uh, with um, the modular view of backpropagation. Uh, he's implemented networks. He's extended, modified Nell's idea so that to enable him to actually start with sentences and then go all the way to documents. So he's able to say whether a review is positive or negative, and then by propagating signals and looking at the result of the output with respect to the input, he's also to find which are the most important sentences, like which are the sentences that are predictive of an output uh, positive review. And that basically what that means is that he can throw away most of the text in the review and just keep a few sentences. So he's able to do extractive summarization. And in fact, if you only have labels at the document le level, so for example, for reviews, we have how many stars are assigned to the review, but we don't have information at the entity level. So there could be a movie that is talking about Tom Cruise and um, someone else, Brad Pitt. And Brad Pitt's a good actor, and Tom Cruise is a terrible actor in that movie. And the review is three. Um, but if you have many movies that involve these two actors, you would be able to actually figure out, using this approach, 
what is the true score in acting for each of these actors independently. So you'll be able to get sentiment at the local level with all information at the group level. Likewise, if you have districts that have all voted and I can get features for people, that's enough to figure out how each individual voted. So it's a way of breaking privacy, in other words, which is useful to know because then people are aware of it. Oh, that's it. Thank you very much.